Bismillah, alhamdulillah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, rasulillah, ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala sama ma ba'a to proceed. So today, inshallah, we will uh, talk about al-firasa, the chapter on astuteness, or babu al-firasa. Uh, and uh, in the fiqh session, we will talk about al-biyu'a, we will start the uh, fiqh of financial transactions the section on the fuck of financial transactions and today we will talk about al buyur talk about some introduction and uh, also um, a definition and uh, you know the uh, maybe we will address some of the pillars and conditions of valid uh, sales uh, but first uh, let's go over babul firasa uh, from manazil al-sa'irin al-imam al-harabi rahimahullah ta'ala said in the chapter of uh, astuteness or on, on astuteness قال الله عز وجل إن في ذلك لآيات للمتوسمين Allah Almighty said indeed uh, in that are signs for those who discern and the word that he used for متوسمين which was interpreted the word متوسمين itself the people who have the, the capacity of discerning was interpreted by a mujahid to be al mutafarrisin so the people who have the capacity of farasa. Farasa. Um, and as we said before, farasa is basically this uh, mental astuteness, uh, but not just the mental astuteness. Uh, in fact, the Sheikh here would be addressing primarily spiritual astuteness. So it's the ability of prediction. It's ability, the ability of prediction to see someone and to tell. Uh, where they're from, uh, what they're doing, uh, what they're up to, uh, to tell about also their uh, basically inner character uh, from their exterior. It's about telling about dakhil from al kharij, telling about the interior from the exterior. It's telling about al khuluq from al khalq. It is telling about the character from the appearance from the external appearance. Um, it is basically something that, that is needed in, in, in many fields, right? Like in medicine, for instance, uh, like in law enforcement, uh, you need to have that basically discerning eye uh, to be able to tell people apart and to know what they are about and what they are up to and things of that nature. So maybe I'll give some examples of what they called Farasa before, what they consider to be Farasa, to have a little bit of understanding of, uh, of Farasa. Uh, so Muhammad ibn al-Hassan and Shafi, uh, may Allah be pleased with them. Uh, you know Muhammad ibn Hassan, one of the main disciples of Abu Hanifa, radiallahu uh, anhum jami'an. And he, him and Shafi, they were sitting and talking about uh, they're, 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 they were sitting and chatting and someone passed by and then they said, well let us figure out uh, what his job is. And Shafi, well, one of them said he is a carpenter, the other one said he's a tailor. So they called him and they, they, they asked him, what, what, what do you work? He said, I was a tailor and then now I'm a, now I'm a carpenter. Uh, so uh, Iyas ibn Muawiyah, Iyas used to be extremely like uh, astute, like uh, as a judge. Uh, one day he passed by a man and uh, they asked him about that man and he said he's from Wasit, he teaches children and he's looking for uh, a runaway slave. So they said to him, where did you, you know, and, and then they went to the man and they asked him, uh, what are you? Uh, what are you doing here? Because he was not from town, and he told them, "I'm from Wasat, and then I'm looking for a runaway slave." And they uh, said to him, uh, "So what? What? Did, what do you work for? What do you do for a living?" And he said to them, "I'm a teacher, teach young boys." So they went back to Yasa and asked him, "So how did you figure this out?" He said, "He said that he has, like his garment has threads." Uh, like red threads that are w w sort of characteristic of garments from Wasit. And uh, so how did he figure out that he, was, uh, that he was teaching young boys? 
uh, or youngsters, and he said that uh, he was paying more attention to young boys, and he was giving salam to young boys and ignoring the you know the elders. Um, and then how they said to him, how they figure out that he was uh, looking for a runaway slave, and that he said to them that he was looking carefully uh, at uh, people with sort of uh, 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 like uh, sort of cheap garments, uh, and he was looking at people who had their face covered. He was looking at people who had their face covered and wearing cheap uh, garments. Uh, so that's how I figured that out. So that he used to be he used to be known for his firasa, uh, this power of prediction. Shafi rahimahullah taala, and that tells you also that firasa can be in part acquired. It is a natural thing. It's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa taala. And this is what the Sheikh is predominantly talking about here. It is the farasa that comes through ilham, which is inspiration or disclosure, which is kashf, uh, that is not dependent on subtle science. You know, here, yes, was using science. Uh, and most of the time, farasa is about using subtle science that other people will not see. You know, th there are certain people who have this ability, like, to. Uh, to, to, to use subtle science, uh, the, be, be, so, uh, certain behaviors uh, give them certain clues uh, about the, the people they're dealing with. Uh, some people can be easily deceived. Some people are not easily deceived. You know, some, some people, for instance, uh, you, you know how, like, uh, sometimes people uh, basically come into a neighborhood or come into a congregation or into a masjid, for instance, and raise funds for various sorts of purposes, whatever investment and so on. Some people can be easily deceived by, you know, so some of them are, you know, genuine and uh, truthful. Some of them are not. Some people are easily deceived by the people that are not particularly genuine. Uh, and some people are not. They, they can tell. They, 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 they feel something wrong. Uh, or they detect uh, that, that the, their behavior uh, or their body language. They detect something about them that, that causes them concern and makes them, you know, uh, uh, basically uh, cautious. So Shafi, rahimahullah, when he was in, in Yemen, and he spent quite some time in Yemen, he was reading a lot of books on Firasa. To be, you know, be, he, so he was learning Firasa. He was learning that astuteness, that power of prediction. Sometimes it's acquired; it can be learned. So, so, and then on his way back to Mecca, he was sort of exercising what he learned. And then he passed by a man, and he he, he figured that, that this man must be uh, stingy, miserly. And then the man called him, uh, and you know, and invited him to food and took good care of him and was very hospitable and so on. And then Shafi said to himself, Ta'isat al-Firasa, you know, <laughs> so which is like, uh, doom this Firasa or uh, what a bad deal that is or like what a waste of time uh, reading all of those books on Firasa. Uh, and then by the time Shafi was about to leave and he told him, I, I live in Mecca and when you come to Mecca, uh, uh, come by and, uh, you know, Nukrimok, we will, you know, be as hospitable to you as you were to us here. And then uh, he was about to leave and the guy told him, wait a second, uh, <laughs> I did all of this for you, I'm, uh, aren't you going to pay me? Uh, <laughs> so then chef realized that it wasn't actually such a waste of time. <laughs> uh, there, there are many other examples, and I don't want to waste all the time, to, you know. But all of those examples are about ferasa. That's that's the mental astuteness. Um, sometimes, like I said, and that's what the sheikh is talking about mainly. It is ilham. It is inspiration by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. 
or uh, disclosure. Even that mental astuteness, that mental astuteness could be a, a gift by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it could be a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or it could be through exercise and learning. You know, such as like, you know, uh, in medicine, for instance, people learn how to pick up certain clues and figure out certain things. In law enforcement, people learn how. So it could be through exercise and learning, if it is about the subtle signs. Uh, or it could be about uh, spiritual discipline, even if it is not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's spiritual discipline. Uh, people who are spiritually disciplined, uh, whether they are Muslim or not, it's just spiritual discipline. Uh, and they do a lot of riyadah, particularly do you know, hunger. Um, the, and and um, endurance in, in worship or perseverance or refle uh, in, in reflection and, and things of that nature. Uh, so those spiritually disciplined people, even if they are not Muslim, they can have firasa, they can have that astuteness. So it's, uh, or it could, the firasa could be from the shaitan also. It could be from you know the uh, shaitan inspiring people of uh, certain things. Um, so it is not always an indication that someone is uh, basically uh, righteous or uh, a saint, uh, in other words. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, uh, Firasa, uh, uh, that's the Firasa that they, they're mainly talking about when, uh, when they talk about the different types of uh, Firasa. Then the Sheikh said, التوسم التفرس وهو استئناس حكم غيب من غير استدلال بشاهد ولا اختبار بتجربة وهي على ثلاث درجات توسم discernment is synonymous with firasa spiritual astuteness it is uh, the realization of a matter of the unseen without obvious indication or empirical experience the realization of, the, of a matter of the unseen without obvious in indication or empirical experience. So the shaykh here basically is dismissing all the farasa that most of the farasa that we talked about, which is the mental astuteness, the ability of prediction that uses subtle science. You know, Iyas ibn Mu'awiyah, he, you know, he said the thread in his garment, you know, he was looking at people, so he had certain indications to figure out what this man, where this man is from, what his profession is, what he's doing, what he's looking for, uh, and, uh, and all of that stuff. Uh, the Sheikh now is telling you that this is not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about uh, the realization of a matter of the unseen without obvious indication or empirical experience. Empirical experience is like you know doctors who figure out uh, through empirical experience that this you know, like uh, when someone has like yellowish discoloration of the, uh, the eyes, they probably are having a problem with the liver or something of that nature. That's empirical experience. And then obvious indication like ES and the thread in the garment or, or, or things of that nature. Uh, but he's saying that this is not what I'm talking about now. I'm talking about something else and he's talking about ilham and, uh, which is inspiration and kashf which is disclosure. It's basically the light that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants to his uh, servants with which they can discern things apart. Uh, there is a hadith in Tirmidhi with a controversial uh, uh, chain in which the Prophet وسلم, said that taqu firasat al-mu'min fa innahu yanzuru bi nurillah. Uh, beware of the firasa, the astuteness of a believer, because he is uh, basically, uh, uh, he sees with the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, he sees with the light of Allah, binurillah. Uh, and may, uh, some of the scholars of hadith accepted it, and the meaning of this hadith is, is a valid meaning, is an acceptable meaning. There's no controversy over the meaning of it, it's just over, you know, about the... the traceability to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it is likely traceable. So, so here the, the nur of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala could be uh, through inspiration or could be through uh, this disclosure and that is what the Shaykh is mainly talking about but this also m makes it uh, incumbent on us to address the issue of the unseen and how can people have access to the unseen? Shouldn't the unseen be the prerogative 
of Allah only. Shouldn't the unseen be the exclusive domain of Allah? Didn't Allah say in Surah Al-Naml, قُلْ لَا يَعْلَمُ مِنَ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ الْغَيْبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ أَيَّانَ يَبْعَثُونَ uh, say no one in the heavens or the earth knows the ghayb, the unseen, except Allah. And they know not when they will be resurrected. So uh, uh, shouldn't the unseen be the exclusive domain of Allah? Right or wrong? It is. Because he said, Say no one in the heavens or the earth knows the unseen except Allah. But now, that is basically... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the unseen without being told about it, of it, right? You know, it, it. But can someone be told about some aspects of the unseen? Yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Ali Imran, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُطْلَعَكُمْ عَلَى الْغَيْبُ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَجْتَبِي مِنْ رُسُلِهِ مَا يَشَاءُ And Allah would have not exposed the unseen to you, would have not revealed the unseen to you. Allah would not reveal the unseen to you, but Allah selects of his messengers whomever he pleases. Whomever he pleases. Which means what? That the messengers can have some access to some of the unseen. To some of the unseen. Why am I saying some? What is the difference between the messenger's knowledge of the unseen and Allah's knowledge of the unseen? Yeah. Well, the messenger's knowledge of the unseen is contingent upon his permission, upon his disclosure of it to them. You know, his knowledge of the unseen is not contingent upon anything. It's absolute. Uh, and it is absolute also in the, in the fact that the none of the unseen is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when it comes to the messengers, they, have, they are given access to some of the unseen. Some of them. Uh, uh, like when they asked the, the Prophet sallallahu about the sa'ah several times, and he did not, you know, he told them that, عِنْدَ رَبِّي لَا لِوَقْتِهَا إِلَّا هُوْ you know, its knowledge is with my Lord. No one will. Ex well, no one knows it. And no one uh, uh, can reveal it ex or expose it except Him. So, the knowledge of the messengers is contingent upon His permission. The knowledge of the messengers is also limited. It is not absolute, like the knowledge of Allah, uh, the knowledge of the unseen that Allah has. But then, so that, that's the messengers, and we understand, yes, messengers can be given some access to some of the unseen, and, and because they do need this to show uh, the people their credibility and to prove their uh, prophethood and, and things of that nature. But what about other people who are not messengers? Can they have any access to the unseen? Yes, they can have some access to the unseen. It's called karamat. Karamat also are basically natural, basically transient suspension of the universal order uh, for a particular purpose. Karama means grace. Karama means to be graceful towards someone, to tukrim someone, to be generous to, 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 towards someone. So karama comes from this. So, you know, Allah's, it's a manifestation of Allah's generosity towards uh, those people. But it is not only it is not only to honor uh, the people. Sometimes it's to help them. It's to assist them. Sometimes someone in the beginning of his path needs a little bit of assistance. So he may be shown some karamat or you know some interruptions of the universal uh, order for him uh, to assist them. And they should not be deluded by this. They should not think that they are at the end of the of the path. They may be just at the beginning. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to push them, wants to propel them forward, wants to assist them. So it's not, only an, it's not always an indication that someone reached the end of the path. Someone could be just at the very beginning. Someone could have actually be immersed in sin and be granted a, a, like a, a form of karama to, to pull them out of uh, the, the, you know, this environment or uh, this lifestyle. Huh? Can be as well? Interruption of universal order can happen to a lot of people for a lot of reasons. 
uh, and, and we said before that for, for non-Muslims, firasa could be acquired through spiritual discipline uh, to, to have this ability to see through things and to tell things apart. Uh, it can be acquired through spiritual discipline. But the karama in terms of, you know, to honor someone, that is for awliya al salihin that is for the, you know, the, the, uh, the awliya, which has uh, pretty much no translation. So the, the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, are the ones that are granted karamat to, uh, to be honored, you know, but other other people can have some karamat f for their own, uh, you know, benefit for to, to be assisted, helped, and, and and so on. Someone could be having like a very hard time, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will show them something uh, to uh, basically alleviate some of their hardship. But then in this case, the, 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 what is the difference between the karamat of those people, the karamat, the graces that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants to uh, uh, people other than the prophets and messengers? Two very important differences, two extremely important differences. The karamat that some people may have that are, who are not prophets and messengers are not certain, are not certain. They may not always be true, you know, uh, so... so or, or maybe, I should not say this, if it is a karama, it is true, but what I'm saying here is when, when, they, have, when they predict something, for instance, uh, based on inspiration or disclosure, that inspiration or disclosure may be imagined at times, not always certain, in other words. You know, for the prophets and messengers, it cannot be uncertain. It cannot be basically hit and miss, sometimes hit and sometimes miss, because th that would basically taint their credibility. You know, that, 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 you know a messenger sh should not be telling people about things and then they, uh, they don't uh, come true. Uh, but for other than the messengers, it is not always certain. Therefore, they should not rely on them like prophets and messengers would rely on disclosure or wahi. It's not a matter of wahi, like a direct revelation. It's just inspiration. So, inspiration. So you should not rely on them. Are they at the end of the day uh, helpful? Yes, we, we'll, we'll come back and say that they may be helpful for sure. Uh, but, 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 but that is an important difference here between the disclosure to the NBA which is a wahi, which is direct wahi revelation, and to the awliya and to the other believers, which is a form of ilham. It's, it's good as far as a good omen is concerned. You know, it's, it's a good omen. It's some, but it is some, it's not something that you rely on completely and you're certain of its veracity. Um, the other difference here is that it is not to be shown off for credibility, for, for the uh, acquisition of more credibility. So uh, uh, the awliya, uh, they say that they cover their karamat, uh, they conceal their karamat uh, like sinners would conceal their sins. They are very protective of their karamat, they conceal them. They are not going around showing them off to earn credibility because after all that is not you know, an appropriate behavior of a wali. Uh, so, uh, but the, the, the messengers show them off. Because the, the difference between the mu'jizah, the mu'jizah is to be shown off, you know, to prove, you know, I want you to believe me uh, about what I, what I convey to you or what I relate to you from God. Here, here are my proofs. Here are my credentials. Here are my mu'jizat. But when it comes to the wali, why does the wali need to do this? Except maybe very rarely with someone who is not Muslim or like to you know, impress someone. But, but not for public consumption. Not for earning credibility among the public. Not for earning status or anything of that nature. They should be concealed. They should not uh, be shown off. Uh, they do not. They are not to prove Credibility. The wali does not need to prove credibility because at the end of the day, what the wali does 
if he is a scholar and he's the, he teaches the people things, is basically to tell them that this is what the messenger had told us, and this is the interpretation, and this is the, this, and the interpretation should make sense linguistically. It should be, you know, uh, something that is consistent with uh, the, the interpretation of the righteous predecessors and so on and so forth. So he, he, is not, he does not need to tell the people, now you follow me blindly. Because at the end of the day, when you follow the messenger, uh, it, it, it is certainly not blind following uh, in, the, in the negative sense of the word, but to some extent it is blind following. It's, you're, not, there are no, you're not questioning the messenger. Uh, the, uh, you're only asking, how do we do this? Uh, you're not asking him, why should we do it? You're asking him, how, we do, how do we do it? And if you ever ask him, why should we do it? It is not basically to, to, uh, to determine whether you will act upon it or not. It is basically for the comfort of your heart for, uh, and for, for your also ability to uh, explain it better to others and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the, 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 these are important differences between Mu'ajizat and Karamat, important differences. Mu'ajizat are certain, they don't ever miss. Karamat may not be as certain, uh, particularly when it comes to disclosure. Uh, the other one is the fact that Mu'ajizat are to be uh, demonstrated uh, to the people. <coughs> Uh, to prove the, 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 the messengership or the prophethood of the prophet, karamat uh, are not, uh, by default, are not. Uh, so when someone uh, talks, to, uh, you know, talks about karamat or how they have disclosures or so on and so forth, uh, you particularly do not... Uh, it, it, it may come as a coincidence. It's not like someone trying to show them off. In fact, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah uh, gives like many examples of the firasa of Imam Taymiyyah rahimahullah in, in Madaraj al-Salikin, in, in this uh, particular chapter, or this particular station. So he tells of so many things that Imam Taymiyyah had uh, predicted and they, they, they came true and he gives so many examples and he says, says that the, the older disciples of Imam Ibn Taymiyyah know a lot more than I do. But he told them for instance uh, when he went to Egypt and they told him that you may be killed, uh, there was like a particular ruler that, that was not particularly uh, friendly towards, uh, towards Imam Taymiyyah so they told him you will be killed, he said no I will not be killed. Uh, they told them they'll put you in jail. He said, yes, they will. Uh, and then I will spend uh, this much time and I'll come out and I will uh, preach, you know, and I will basically preach the sunnah and so on and so forth. And they said that everything he said did happen. Uh, they all, he also foretold the, uh, an invasion by the Tatars. Uh, even before they mobilized their, their troops from the, the point of origin. They told them that they will come and they'll invade. Uh, so, and then they were concerned about, you know, a slaughter, a massacre. He told them, no, this time they will not do any of that. This time they will only, they will only be interested in money. And then when the Tatars invaded, they were only, they, they, they were only uh, interested in, you know, uh, in money. Uh, they, they did not particularly cause any bloodshed. And then there was another time where he re was trying to recruit the people and tried to recruit the Sultan and brought him from Egypt uh, to fight against the daughters in, uh, in the Battle of Shakhab. And he himself was one of the horsemen in that battle. And uh, so, he, uh, so he was telling them that he was trying to sort of comfort to them, and he was telling them that he will win this, this battle against the Tatars. And then they told him, say, inshallah, you know, and he said, uh, uh, I say it uh, as a, uh, for affirmation, not for contingency. So it, you know, and then they, they kept on sort of pushing him and pushing him, and, 
And then he said to them, it is written in the preserved tablet that you will win. Uh, and, and that was like, you know, so sometimes they, they, you don't do this, like you should not be doing this. It's like Sufyan al-Thawri one time when he said, uh, uh, if he, uh, you know, he said about uh, Abu Ja'far al-Mansur, uh, if he actually uh, comes into Mecca while I'm in Mecca, I would be clear of him. Clear of whom? You know, clear of God. You know, so, so he would not come in. He said Abu Jafar is not going to make it to Mecca. And he was actually marching towards Mecca. And days, one day before he reached Mecca, he died. Uh, but Sufyan, that statement, we did say this before. That statement is uh, certainly like a little bit shocking. Uh, but he is comfortable, he was comfortable with his disclosure to the point where he made that statement. And this is a state of embassad, expansion. You know, affability with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like, you do not do like them because, you know, they can handle this stuff. It's like you, you walk behind someone or you, you jump behind uh, someone uh, and like an athletic they make it, you fall. So don't, don't imitate them in this regard. But at the same time, understand that they, they have like sort of their own uh, stations uh, that we have not reached yet. So he, he said, and, and certainly the, Muslim, the Muslims won in the, the, the Battle of Shakha, but why did he say this? Why, why, why? He wanted, you know, basically to strengthen their hearts. He wanted to tell them because they, they have, you know, these are the tutters. They, they have been beating the Muslims over and over and over again. He wanted to tell them, you will win. Don't go into, in the, into the, this uh, thinking that you will lose you will win. I swear that you will win. And then he, he was, when they just bothered him, he was forced to tell them that this is pre written in the, in the preserved tablet. He was very confident of his disclosure in this case. Uh, but like I said, you don't imitate them in this regard. You understand that at the end of the day, regardless of his comfort, uh, his disclosure is still uncertain. Is still uncertain. You know, it would be certain if it was a prophet. Uh, he can be as confident as he wants, as comfortable as he wants. Any wali could be as comfortable or confident in his disclosure as he wants, but disclosures are certain only for the prophets and messengers. The second thing, uh, they should not be shown off. Here he was telling them because of a particular, of a sort of a legitimate, uh, a legitimate cause here. The cause here is to strengthen their hearts, to encourage them, to motivate them to fight like they're going to win. Not to fight thinking that they'll lose because they have been losing to the Tatars forever. Uh, so that's, you know, because uh, you know, I, I know that we uh, spent too much time on this, but, but or so much time, not too much time, so much time on this. But it it is a, an important matter. Then the Sheikh said, "Wahey ala tharathi darajat." It is of three levels. Al ula firasatun tariatun nadiratun tasqutu ala lisan wahshi fi al-umri marra li hajati sami murid sadiq ilayha. لا يتوقف على مخرجها ولا يؤبه لصاحبها وهذا شيء لا يخلص من الكها من الكها من الكهانة وما ضاهها لأنها لم تشر عن عين ولم تصدر عن علم ولم تسق بوجود. Uh, that's a somewhat complicated, convoluted a little bit, but he says that it is transient and rare farasa. There is the first degree, transient and rare farasa, which descends on the uncultivated tongue once in a lifetime for the need of a sincere seeker to hear it. 
the reason of its utterance is not traceable and the one who utters it is insignificant. This is something that cannot be differentiated from fortune telling and its likes because it does not refer to certainty and does not emanate from knowledge and is not driven by an existent state, an existent had spiritual state or something. So he's saying that this is Ramiyatun min ghayr rami. This is a good, a good shot by a bad shooter. Uh, so firasa sometimes can come out on out of the mouth of someone who is completely insignificant. Uh, you would not expect that firasa would come out of this person because they don't have any state uh, or status and or spiritual state that that would qualify them to have firasa. But tasqutu ala lisanin wahshay, a tongue that is not even heedful, that is not even in remembrance, someone who is not in remembrance. And that is to say that wisdom can be still harvested from the uncultivated hearts. Wisdom could be still harvested from the uncultivated hearts. And he's saying here, why, so why? Why? So you're, you're just like anyone, you know, something of about the unseen can be told by someone who does not have any ranking, does not have any status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? لِحَاجَةِ سَمْعِ مُرِيدٍ صَادِقٍ إِلَيْهَا He says, uh, for the need of a sincere seeker to hear it. For a need of a sincere seeker to hear it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would use this person to tell another person who is deserving of hearing something. Uh, could be like a good omen, for instance. The Prophet sallallahu liked good omens. The Prophet liked good omens. He said in a hadith that is agreed upon, uh, uh, or he said the kalima as So the, the, the Prophet said La adwa wa la tayara. There is sometimes they translate this as there is no infection, there is no transitive disease, but the better translation is contagiousness. There is no contagiousness and there is no bird omen uh, or bird omens, like evil omens. hasan And I like good omens. They said, what is a good omen, O Messenger of Allah? He said a good word, a good word. Uh, so uh, good omens, you may hear them from anyone not necessarily from the most cultivated hearts, but you could hear a good omen from anyone. And in this case, it is a bishara for you. It is a good thing for you uh, if you needed this, if you needed to hear it for support or for encouragement or any of that, uh, then it is a good bishara uh, for you. وَحِبُّ الْفَأْلَ hasan. Of course, لَا adwa, no contagiousness, وَلَا tayara, and no evil omens, that all, uh, that, that is not, understood literally la adwa means adwa is not an uh, an independent efficient cause remember the four causes uh, adwa is not an independent efficient cause other in other words that it does not work except with the permission and leave of allah uh, did the prophet sallallahu say when the when plague uh, basically takes place in one city don't enter it and don't leave it that is the idea of the modern quarantine. He pointed out that idea 1400 years ago, don't go out, don't go in. So he's saying there is contagiousness in this case. He said run away from the leper like you run away from the, uh, a lion. But at the same time he ate with a leper from the same dish. He ate with a leper from the same dish. Why did he do this? To show the people, to show the people why did he say this and do this? To show the people that there is contagiousness and you want to be careful, you want to be cautious, but at the same time, uh, you know, it, it only works with the leave and permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that does not mean that we all, you know, abandon those who are in need. There will be still people that need to take care of them. And he, as a Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, was 
one of those people. I, you know, like, I am not going to run away from the leper. Who will give him the message? You know, you as a, like a, a physician or a nurse or this or that will not run away from the leper. Who's going to treat him? Uh, except, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that is the importance of having a comprehensive understanding of the hadith and not basically sort of having like a sp sporadic uh, knowledge of uh, like a limited number of hadith and that's why we need to, to, to basically study the interpretation because those uh, scholars of, of the past they have this comprehensive knowledge and then they'll put things together before they interpret them whereas we could be hasty and uh, not having that comprehensive knowledge uh, and then we arrive at the completely wrong and sometimes disastrous understanding. Okay, so the first type of farasa is clear, right? It is f uh, like a transient thing that, that is, can be harvested from an uncultivated heart, a tongue that does not remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that comes out uh, of that person for the need of another person who uh, may, may uh, hear it. This cannot be sorted out from, uh, from Kahana uh, or Kehana, uh, basically the, the fortune telling, because the, the person is not worthy of it. Uh, so use it as a good omen, but it doesn't mean any more than that. You could use it as a good omen, it doesn't mean anything. In the, but if it is bad, then the Prophet said, La tayara, no bad omens, no evil omens. Disregard them. Tayara is the bird omen because they used to, if they, if they came out and the bird, you know, if they came out of their homes and the bird came from one side, from the left side, certain birds, you know, that they would feel bad for the rest of the day. They'll be pessimistic for the rest of the day and the Prophet hated that and forbade that. So if you hear a good thing, you know, good, you know, get motivated. If you hear a bad thing, Ignore it, you know, don't be deterred by it. Just keep, move on. And then uh, he, he, uh, he said the Daraja Thaniya, which is the second level. Firasa tujna min gharsi al-Iman. Firasa tujna min gharsi al-Iman. Firasa that is the fruit of Iman. Watatlu'u min sahat al-Hal. It sprouts from uh, the true Hal or the true state. وَتَلْمَعُ مِن نُورِ الْكَشْفِ And shines with the light of disclosure. فِرَاسَةَ تُجْنَ مِنْ غَرْسِ الْإِيمَانِ The second level is the firasa that is basically granted to the believers. This is something that is, you know, harvested from the cultivated heart now, not the uncultivated heart. It is the result of iman, the result of faith, the result of spiritual states, the result of spiritual refinement, spiritual training, spiritual discipline, and you go through this, and sahar, basically to staying up uh, late in the night, uh, jua, staying up late in the night in dhikr, in remembrance, in prayer, uh, in res you know, doing something good, you know, looking out, uh, also looking after people and looking out for the in, uh, interest of people and uh, uh, like they, they used to do uh, like uh, Ali ibn al-Husayn radiallahu anhu Ali ibn al-Husayn ibn Ali uh, radiallahu anhum uh, when he died they found out the, you know 100 families in Medina uh, uh, basically suddenly lost their sustenance because he used every night to go out and carry food and drop it in front of their uh, doors um, in privacy uh, and then make it back home you know wearing uh, lisam covering his face and then make it back back home no one knew uh, where this is coming from until he died and all of them figured out the next day uh, that it was actually him so if you, if you do this, and then you have also uh, experienced jua, which is hunger, but hunger not, is not a virtue in and of itself, like you're fasting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you're cutting down on eating for that spiritual uh, 
refinement, uh, to release your uh, spirit from the captivity of the carnal desires, uh, which could be uh, certainly uh, a burdensome for the spirit. You know, the, 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 the concern, the, the uh, sort of the constant concern with carnal desires, with fleshy, lower desires of the body could certainly harm uh, the spirit. Uh, so uh, this is something that can be cultivated. This is something that can be acquired. And he says it shines with the light of disclosure, shines with the light of disclosure. So it could be ilham, and then it could be real disclosure. It could be an inspiration, but it could be also real disclosure where Allah gives you a transient access. Not guaranteed, because you're not a prophet, but uh, yet it's still an honorable thing. What Darajat was saying, and then he talked about the third level, Firasatun Sariya, a most noble Firasa. Lam Tajtalibha Rawiya, that is not produced by deliberation, ala lisan in Mustana, in Tasrihan or Ramza, but comes out or comes forth from the chosen tongues, either explicitly or through symbolism, either explicitly or through symbolism. You know, this is the third phase, the phase of self-annihilation, self-absorption, uh, or I'm sorry, self-annihilation or absorption into the divine. Uh, and in, in this case, it's the most noble ferasa. It would be as close to certain as possible. This would be as close. Remember when uh, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, it is written in the preserved tablet that you will win. So it is as close to possible, still not certain, still not certain, Can, should not be treated as certain from anyone short of a prophet or a messenger. Could be as confident, you could act on Galabat al Zan and you could be motivated because most likely it will be true, most likely. But you can never, you never say most likely with a prophet, right? Is that, that, that basically destroys the whole concept of prophethood if it is just most likely, you know? But you could say this with the awliya. Most likely you'll be right. Uh, but it gets as, as close as possible to certain with the more spiritual refinement. Uh, and it, is, it, it comes forth from the chosen tongues, you know, the ones who, who are most chosen because it's the most noble farasa. Uh, either explicitly or through symbolism. Either explicitly or through symbolism. If people can handle it explicitly, you tell them of it explicitly, uh, or if you believe that for some reason it should be told through symbolism, then uh, you use symbolism. And, uh, and uh, still, uh, you, you don't uh, yourself get deluded by it. Uh, by any karama, you're still cautious. Abu Bakr uh, radiallahu anhu, the most deserving of uh, Allah's karama, he was always cautious. He said, if one of my two feet is in paradise and the other, other one is outside, I will not, be sa I will not feel safe uh, from Allah's plans. Uh, so uh, you should never, uh, regardless of uh, what you go through, get uh, deluded by uh, those states or those disclosures. Uh, that's it with the with, with the station of Firasa. Uh, but I hope that it is clear, and then I go back to it because it, it is a, it's, it's a common problem. Sometimes also because of partisanship, because certain people have certain ideas about the unseen or uh, access to the unseen, and they can't really differentiate between things they could hear that you know someone had a disclosure and say that they, these are uh, basically crooks or something like that which is not right uh, that may be true it may be a karama it is not you're not in a position to say about a righteous servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they are um, uh, basically deviant or anything uh, this is, there is, the concept of karama is not a bid'ah, it is a real concept. Karama is different from the mu'jizah of the Prophet the prophets, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in some regards, know the difference between this and that, and you will be okay. But at the end of the day, 
the karamat are not used to establish credibility. And when someone has a karama or someone has a disclosure uh, that does not make their interpretation or their declarations about the deen immune to uh, error, absolutely not. It does not make them infallible. You still, even if you see it, even if you see, and that is what the, uh, the masters of the past have always said. If you see someone flying in the air, walking on water, don't give them any consideration until you see how steadfast and straight they are on the Sharia. Don't pay any attention to them until you see how steadfast and uh, straight they are on the uh, Sharia. That's what the, the, the great uh, masters of Sunni Sufism have always emphasized and have always stressed. قُلُ قَوْلِ هَذَا أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ لَكُمْ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُ مُحَمْدِكَ شَلَى اللَّهِ لَأَنْتَ أَسْتَغْفِرُكَ وَأَتُوبُ إِلَيْهِ